The divorce rate in our country continues to run rampant. But according to our Bible teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, divorce isn't the problem. It's merely a symptom. Welcome to Through the Bible. I'm your host, Steve Schwetz, and today we'll hear Dr. McGee discuss the real issue, marriage. So turn in your Bibles to Malachi chapter 2, where we'll study verses 10 through 15, a message Dr. McGee called the best love. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your love for us and your patience with us when we're not able to love unconditionally like you do. As we study your word, Lord, please reveal to us the building blocks required for strong and lasting marriages. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, friends, we're down in this section where the Lord is rebuking the people because of their social sins. He'll be rebuking them a little later because of their religious sins. But here it's the social sins that has to do with the home and with the family. And specifically, he had said in verse 11, Judah hath dealt treacherously, and an abomination is committed in Israel and Jerusalem. For Judah hath profaned the holiness of the Lord, which he loved. Well, what did they do? Well, he makes it very clear. He spells it out and hath married the daughter of a foreign god. That is, it married heathen women. Well, what about their own wives? Well, the Lord says to them in verse 13, And this have ye done again, covering the altar with tears and weeping, with crying out, insomuch that he regardeth not the offering any more, nor receiveth it with good will at your hand. Now, they had put aside their wives, they had divorced them. They had married these heathen girls that they had met. But they continued to go to the altar, the temple worship, and bring the offerings. God says, I'm not accepting it, nor will I receive it. Verse 14, yet ye say, why? Now again, with hurt feelings and with a note of surprise, they say, well, why? We're such nice people. We're going to the temple worship. He spells it out, because the Lord hath been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth. That's your first wife, you see. Against whom thou hast dealt treacherously, yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. And then verse 15 that follows, some of the expositors considered this the most difficult verse in the entire book of Malachi. Well, Frankly, a poor, simple preacher like I am, why, to me, it can only mean one thing because that's what it says. And I'm reading, and did not he make one, that is, a man and a woman, yet had he the residue of the Spirit, and why one, that he might seek a godly seed? Therefore, take heed to your spirit, let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. Now, God says that he has rejected all their offering because of the fact they were wrong in the family. They had put aside the wife of their youth in order that they might marry these heathen women, and that was the purpose of it. Last time, I followed through by seeing that the Lord Jesus put down one very definite, specific reason for divorce. And that reason, as well as any others, because of the hardness of the hearts of men and women, because of sin that's entered the world. And then Paul makes it clear that when a believer and unbeliever, now you see the Lord Jesus was not speaking into that situation. He's speaking to a people who were all of the same race, all supposed to be worshiping the same God. But now Paul said, for the benefit of the Corinthians, because some of you over there got converted and you were already married, what should you do? Well, if the unbeliever will stay with you and you can make a home where there'll be peace and happiness, 
continue. But if that's impossible and the unbeliever walks out on you, then you're not bound. And for that reason, divorce would be permitted. Now, this passage in Malachi is the longest passage that you have in the Old Testament on the subject of divorce. God made not a broad basis for it under the law, as we looked at that yesterday in Deuteronomy 24. Actually, what he was doing there was making a basis that if a man found uncleanness, and I actually believe that when you say man, it's generic, it could be the man or woman with the wife would find uncleanness in the husband. Now, you have here something that I think today has been neglected, and the important thing is the thing that's wrong is not the getting of a divorce so much today as it's the fact that they're getting married. That is, those that are getting married who ought not to be married at all. Now, in this connection, I have a letter that came from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and I want you to hear this because it's marriage that has to be made right or the divorce naturally is the thing that's in the future. They ought not to get married. <laughs> it's not that they ought not to get a divorce. I'm reading. I was able to listen to your broadcast for the first time in months today. What a tremendous blessing. I never thought I'd miss that southern rasp until the station you were on was canceled. And I want you to know that that's not a southern rasp. I ought to correct that immediately. That is that pure language that Zechariah talks about that in the millennium they're going to speak. So you're hearing that accent. All right, then she tells about one station went off. That is, it was canceled, even the station. But we went on another station, and at first she didn't know that. I'm reading, now I owe you an apology for my stupid behavior. Your broadcasts in media, or media, I'm not sure how it's pronounced, Pennsylvania was canceled like a nitwit. I wrote to the FCC and told them they were dummies for canceling the station. I wrote to you complaining and asked that other listeners write to the FCC. How very foolish. The Lord has shown me something I never would have learned without being deprived of his word through the broadcast. I was given a hunger, a deep, deep hunger for the knowledge only found in the word of the living God. One night at 2 a.m., I woke up my husband, shared with him my hunger for Christ. You see, I only thought I knew Christ, but I hadn't let him take control. After we prayed, I was flooded with a peace beyond description. Our marriage is so very dear now, all because of Christ. My husband accepted Christ when he was seven years old. I can't begin to tell you all the blessings we've received together since that night. When the Lord gives to his children, he does it bountifully. Jesus is so very precious, my heart is filled with thanksgiving for your broadcasts. Now, let me say this. You see that it's the marriage that is the important thing. And you can't correct certain situations when it starts out wrong. The Lord Jesus went back to it, and Paul refers to it. And here in verse 15, Malachi goes back to it. And did not he make one? That is, he made one. Adam and Eve were one. And that's important for us to see. Now we saw there was no help that was meat for Adam. He had no help from the underworld, that is, the animal world beneath him. And certainly he could not find a companion among angels. Now God took from Adam, as we saw, a rib. And this is not some foolish story. But why didn't he make woman out of the ground as he made man? Because of the fact he wants to impress upon man that woman is part of man. Man is only half a man without a woman, if you please. And that is the picture that you have. And as we said, she wasn't taken from his head to be his mental superior. She's not taken from his feet in order to be a servant. She's taken from his side. She's to be a companion. She's to help him. They together are going to become one. Now, how will 
one plus one equal one. And that's God's arithmetic, by the way, and it's accurate. Verse 23 now of chapter 2 of Genesis. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. What's woman? Well, Adam was ish. She is isha. It's the other side. We call them male and female, but it's just the other half of it, the other part of it. This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife. This, may I say, excommunicates mother-in-laws and father-in-law. This removes them from the new family. And I'm not going into that today, but I'm afraid that a great many folk are getting some very wrong instruction because there's one thing about marriage is it establishes a new creation and it has nothing to do with papa and mama. You've left them. And they shall be one flesh. Now, how are they going to be one flesh? Here's man and woman. Woman was taken out of man. Well, they're going to be one flesh in the child that is born. They're going to be one. And actually, what you've got here, one plus one plus one equals one. This is really a mathematical problem. Now, we're told here they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Now, this was before sin had entered into the world, and neither one would look upon the other in lust because at that time they are innocent, but they see each other and they know each other. And externally, they certainly knew each other. They did not look upon each other in a lustful manner. But here is a man and a woman, and he looked upon her with tenderness and love. That's exactly what Paul says in Ephesians. And she looked upon him in respect and love. In other words, she could truly say, this is the man for me. And the important thing is, the creation of Eve made Adam a man. And the presence of Adam made Eve a woman, all woman, all man. That's exactly what Paul over in Ephesians has a great deal to say about. And I want to turn to that passage also, because here's something else that is greatly misunderstood. And this has to do with not only a Christian home, but with believers who are spirit-filled. Because he begins all of this, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit, giving thanks and so on, speaking to yourselves in Psalms and submitting yourselves one to another. Now he says, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands, as unto the Lord. And that does not mean obey. He's not talking about obedience here at all. He's talking about she's to respond to man. She's the other part of man. But for the sake of headship, the husband is the head of the wife. Why? Well, because you have to have a head. This is not a monstrosity with two heads. Even as Christ is the head of the church, and he's the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their husbands in everything. And this is based on this. Husbands, love your wife. No wife is asked to become obedient to an alcoholic and to follow him to the bar room. If you think that's what Paul means, you're just entirely wrong. You ought to read it all. Husbands, love your wives. This is the kind of husband that she is to respond to. And it's my belief that a man is the one to say to the woman first, I love you. And when he says that, then she's to respond, I love you. And that leads me to say this, there's no such thing as frigidity in women. That is certainly misunderstood because if she has the right husband, she'll respond to the right man that gives her the right treatment and is her husband in the Lord. Husbands, 
love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself to it. I believe young people today need lots more instruction than they're getting, and they don't need it in the public schools because the only thing that is glorified there is sex. Now, will you note, I'm going to begin today looking at this from a little different viewpoint than probably you've heard before because this does need to be emphasized in our day, and it's going to be the book that we're going to offer in Malachi. The title of it is The Best Love. Now, let me begin here. There is today an obsession with sex that's positively frightening and absolutely alarming. You need only to consult contemporary literature to recognize this. In a leading British paper not long ago, this statement was made. Popular morality is now a wasteland littered with the debris of broken convictions. And it was Judge Barron of the Superior Court of Massachusetts who said, at too many colleges today, promiscuity among students is a dangerous and growing evil. And then the Billy Graham paper decision had an editorial way back in 64, I guess it was. And by the way, these quotations go back that far, but here it is. So our young people go riding down the high road to hell in an atmosphere that would make any self-respecting animal sick to his stomach. And no one thinks that matters are as bad as they seem. And that is a tremendous statement and a good one, by the way. And an outstanding Christian writer in America says, but where are the compelling external cries to match the inner voices of the soul, which at times murmur darkly and other times clamorously that all is not well, that wayward feet are treading the way of wrath, the path of judgment. Then he goes on to say, the answer is not simply in passing more laws. It's to be found in regeneration by the Spirit who alone can set men's souls on fire with a divinely sent thirst for greater purity, both for the individual and for the body politic. Apart from such spiritual burning and purging, men sink beneath the weight and corruption of their own sin. Now, this goes back to about 1965, these quotations, but there are other voices being lifted in alarm. But all about us are the advocates of this erotic cult that falsely claim that all of this emphasis on sex is a signal of a new, broad-minded, and enlightened era. The facts are that there is nothing new about it. Furthermore, it does not mark the entrance upon abundant living. On the contrary, it's characterized the demise of all decadent and decaying civilizations. Egypt, Babylon, Greece, and Rome, to name but a few. The sex symbol marks the decline and fall of many a great and noble people. It's part of the death rattle of a fading nation. The French Revolution marked the departure of the glory of France, and it was during that time that a prostitute was placed on an altar in worship. The excuse for paying this abnormal attention to the subject given by these purveyors of filth and licentiousness is that a blue-nosed generation of the past put the lid down on it. The false charge is made that the Bible and the church have frowned upon the subject of sex until it's taboo today and can only be whispered in secret. They go on to place the blame of present-day marriage failures and the increase in divorce on the gross ignorance of young people. If they only knew more about this fascinating subject, this crowd counsels, there would be success in marriage. And may I add that this is the tragedy of it. It's true that our pilgrims and Puritans were blue-nosed, they were probably a little extreme. I'd certainly agree to that, and I wouldn't want to go back to that period. But this present generation 
hasn't found a solution to this at all. And after all, the Bible doesn't go with either crowd. I do not think that the Puritans had a Bible base it for it. As I said last time, who was it that thought of sex? It wasn't Hollywood, and it wasn't this crowd. They think they've originated it. God is the one that started all of this, my friend, and he wanted to put it on a holy basis. And this crowd, they play upon the fact that we Americans do not like censorship, and therefore they should be free to say and publish what they choose. Well, these modern Pied Pipers of Hamlin are leading the younger generation into a moral morass of debauchery with dirty sex books and pornographic literature. They give the impression that you must be knowledgeable of this lasciviousness and salacious propaganda to be sophisticated and suave and sharp. You ought to know about Arthur Miller's death of a salesman and the Tropic of Cancer and Fanny Hill. The Bible of this group is Playboy magazine. These filthy dreamers have flooded the marketplace and the schoolroom today with this smut and depravity, so much so that a modern father said recently, it's not how much shall I tell my son, but how much does he know that I don't know? In spite of all this new emphasis on sex, the divorce course continue to grind out their monotonous story of the tragedy of modern marriage in ever increasing number. Now, a knowledge of the physical may have its place in preparation for a happy marriage, but it is inadequate per se to make a happy home, and it gives a perverted and abnormal emphasis which does not belong there. Dan Bennett in a column recently said, one of the troubles with the world is that people mistake sex for love, money for brains, and transistor radios for civilization. Well, that's the problem of the hour. Now, the Word of God treats the subject of sex with boldness and frankness and directness, as we have seen. It's not handled as a dirty subject, and it's not taboo nor theoretical, but it's plain and theological, if you please. The Bible is straightforward, and it deals with it in high and lofty language. And that's the reason we're spending time here with Malachi, because God lays it on the line for these people. And that's part of the reason they had gone into captivity, and it's part of the reason they've been scattered. I think it's time, therefore, that God's heard. I feel that the pulpit is long overdue in presenting what God has to say on this subject, but to keep it on the right plane. In the very beginning, it was God who created them male and female. It was God who brought the woman to the man. And I'd like to add this. He did not need to give Adam a lecture on the birds and bees. God blessed them, and marriage became sacred and holy and pure. And my friend, it's the only relationship among men and women that God does bless down here. He promises to bless no other. He says that if marriage is made according to his plan, he'll bless it down here, and there will be happiness. God wants his children to be happily married. He has a plan and purpose for every one of us if we'd only listen to him. And I want to refer to our verse of Scripture here, and we'll talk about it next time, and we'll close on this note. Nevertheless, I have against thee that thou hast left thy first love. That's Revelation 2.4. Until next time, may God richly bless you, my beloved. What a great message. We'll hear more about real love as Dr. McGee's message continues on Monday. I hope that you'll join us. If you'd like to share today's message with a family member or friend, or you just want to spend a little more time considering what we've learned, I've got several options for you. The first is to download Dr. McGee's e-booklet called The Best Love when you visit us at ttb.org. Or if you'd prefer to listen to it, it's also available for purchase on CD when you call 1-800-65-BIBLE or visit our online bookstore at ttb.org. Again, the number to call if you'd like information on The Best Love or any of our Bible study resources, it's 1-800-65-BIBLE. Well, that's all for us today. I'm Steve Schwetz. For everyone at Through the Bible, we're praying that God's great grace, mercy, and peace would be with you until we meet again. To be my own, sin had left a prison.
This program's been brought to you by the faithful friends and supporters of the worldwide ministry of Through the Bible Radio Network.